Hello and welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and I'm here with my great friend Joe Stanley. As always, welcome, Joe. It is so awesome to be here with you, Darcy, as always. And starting today with yet another nod to people coming up with extraordinary ideas that are making a difference. Yes, we love innovation and technology advances right here on the House of Wellness, especially when it comes to people who are recovering from injury or living with a disability, Joe. Which is actually a big part of our community, Darcy. Around 20% of Aussies have a disability. And while we all know about making things more exclusive, like parking spaces and easy access to anywhere, other daily challenges aren't always so obvious. How about this one, Joe? For people suffering arthritis who have trouble bending over to reach their feet, putting on shoes and socks can be really tricky, as you would imagine. So the simple solution is called Sock Aid, and it's a game changer. Oh, mate, I could have done with that when I was pregnant. <laughs> you know, when you can't even see I your toes. I don't, no, but I anymore. can imagine. <laughs> now, we've talked about the life-saving skills of dogs for people who have epilepsy, but there's also a gadget called Smart Belt Joe, which sends out an alert when someone is having a seizure. It's brilliant. And there's Braille Lego, Das. Remember, we had that on the show recently. And there's Braille smartphones for vision impaired people, too. And let's not stop there. A startup company in London has come up with another incredible innovation. It's a smart cane that's designed to replace the white standard cane that's been around forever. I spoke with one of its inventors to find out more about this revolutionary device. You are head of R&D at WeWalk and you also are visually impaired. Do you have any sight at all? So I do indeed. I have something called Libra's congenital amaurosis, which gives me some residual sight. It's essentially like looking through, um, you know, a, a very narrow tunnel. Um, so it cuts your peripheral vision. In daytime, it's just enough to sort of mobilise independently with sight. But at nighttime, it does essentially lead to night blindness. And I understand that you, along with many, many other people, have used the white cane, which is the same tool that has been used for decades. Is that right? It is indeed. So, I mean, the white cane is an amazing tool. Don't get me wrong. You know, we have nothing against the white cane itself. We think it's, you know, our symbol of independence. It's great for detecting ground level obstacles. And the orientation and mobility, which visually impaired people have relied on for, well, forever, basically, is crucial to using WeWalk. It doesn't replace any of that. What we do is we just take the standard cane and we improve it with technology. So what was the impetus for designing something that has taken a tool that has been used for many, many years and bringing it more into the 21st century. The cane itself, you know, is a tool we love. It's an amazing tool. It's a tool which, you know, 50 million people rely on, actually. It's a fundamental tool. And we realised, well, hey, wait a second. It does ground-level obstacle detection so well. It, you know, it's a symbol of our independence. But the thing is, it hasn't really evolved, right? Like, it is a tool which really deserves a 21st century makeover by now. And that's the whole idea behind WeWalk. You know, how do we revolutionize a tool which has been used for so long? And how do we make it sort of help visually impaired people in today's sprawling urban environments? Can you explain to us exactly what WeWalk can do? Um, so it's actually really, really simple. It's an exercise in simplicity. This is a standard cane. It's actually an Ambitech graphite cane, so a really great cane as a foundation. And we've just taken the rubber handle of a standard cane, we've chopped it off, we replaced it with a small screw adapter, and then that's WeWalk. So the cane still folds up normally, it still has the same tip at the end of it, it's still used exactly like a regular cane. But the handle itself has all the tech built inside it. Um, so, you know, in conjunction with your ground level obstacle detection, which your tip does, you know, this is amazing at what it can tell you about the ground. The top of the cane has an ultrasonic sensor built into it. So this will give you upper body obstacle detection, things like tree branches, you know, signposts, things which the bottom of the cane might typically miss. But where we go further is apart from just that sort of whole body obstacle detection, we've got a touchpad as well as a built-in speaker and microphone built into WeWalk so that you can actually talk to your cane and the cane will talk to you. So you can use the touchpad to navigate through our smartphone app. You can check out you know, public transit, what bus is gonna arrive at your stop. You can get exploration modes. So as you're walking past you know, a shop or whatever, we will actually talk to you and tell you, hey, by the way, there's a shop called X to your left. And so you talk to it like you might 
ask Siri or, you know, Google or, you know, that's how you speak with the top part of, part of the cane? Exactly. And have you found people of all ages have been able to adopt and adapt to the WeWalk? Generally, we've seen that even sort of the older uh, population, people with something called macular degeneration, you know, they tend to use WeWalk. They tend to love sort of the tech aspect of it. Sort of teenagers, young adults love the cool factor. I have to say, I mean, <laughs> people stopping and asking, whoa, what is that? You know, what's that attached to your cane? That, that's a really great feeling. It must be very satisfying to you to be able to use your skills and your knowledge to create something that is making such a difference to a huge portion of our community. So the whole principle behind the founding team and everyone at WeWalk is this whole sort of making societal change, you know, helping people out, you know, making sure we're, we're providing technology to people who may not have been able to access it before. Isn't that just incredible? I mean, considering we have satellites that guide us to any destination and even driverless cars, it does seem pretty archaic to expect people to get about using only a stick. Yeah, it's a good point. Even the inventor describes the white cane as a tool from the Stone Age, Joe. Jean-Marc and his team are hoping to get the smart cane subsidised by the government in the same way guide dogs are, but we'll keep you posted about any news regarding the smart cane's release here in Australia. Up next, we meet the daughter of an AFL legend who's on a mission for mental health. Chelsea Frawley joins us next, right here on the House of Wellness. Welcome back. Right now, both in the wider community and across all sporting codes, Joe, there's a big push on to pay attention to players' mental health. When I started many years ago, there just wasn't an option. There weren't places to go and you didn't feel comfortable at all uh, speaking out about any issues. If there was a club psychologist, you didn't really want to go and see them because of the stigma that came with, uh, with that visit. And it's so great that it's changed, that we now feel that we can and, and should be able to speak about it because there's really no difference behind the scenes. Sports people face the same battles as everybody else. We sure do, Joe. An AFL champion, Danny Spud Frawley, was a superstar of the AFL. What a career he had with St Kilda. He captained the club from 1987 to 1995, one of their greatest ever players. He won the club's best and fairest, played many, many state of origin games, went on to coach the Richmond Football Club as well. He was then chief executive of the AFL Coaches Association had a larger-than-life media career, worked as a commentator across many mediums, uh, TV and radio. But he also had a long battle with depression and was a trailblazer in starting the conversation about mental health. And sadly, we lost Danny in 2019. But we're incredibly grateful to have his daughter Chelsea join us today. Chelsea, thanks for joining us on the House of Wellness. Thank you for having me. We loved your dad. I, I had the great pleasure of working with him for over a decade and we still miss him. The footage back and you're waiting for him to come in the room and light up the room with his humour and, you know, if you were... If, if, I can just hear him saying, you're getting ahead of yourself again, Das. I've, I've got an eye on you. And you just knew there was going to be a laugh and a smile. It must have been a tough time. Yeah, it absolutely was. Like, uh, for our family, like, our hearts will be forever broken. Um, he was more than a dad to me and my sisters and obviously to mum as well. He was um, our mentor and our best friend. And um, to have him lose his battle with mental illness is just devastating in our hearts, yeah. We'll just be forever broken. And for me, Joe, you're talking about the, one of the toughest players you've ever seen, a fourth or fifth generation spud farmer from Bungaree outside Ballarat. I played my first ever game on Danny and that was an experience. <laughs> you wore a few in the back of the head if you were if you're on Danny. And the toughest male you could find to then understand that it doesn't discriminate, does it, Chelsea? That, and Danny was fantastic and he used to talk to us all the time. We've got to speak more. You've got to get your mates together. You've got to talk. He was really on a, a mission to have this conversation, wasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, in the final years of his life, he was really passionate about encouraging that vulnerability amongst um, his male friendship groups and the wider public as well. And having those conversations when you are struggling, um, I think that he really encouraged for the first protocol would be to reach out to a mate and have that conversation because that mate will be there for you. And now you're working with the St Kilda Football Club on a whole range of mental health programs, including a tribute game for your dad. It's called Spud's Game Time to Talk. So tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so the St Kilda Football Club came to me and my family in late November last year. They were originally planning just a tribute match to say goodbye, to allow the fans to say goodbye to um, one of the club greats. But 
we all felt that it was important that we keep this legacy going, which is how we came up with the concept, Time to Talk, um, which encourages conversations amongst mates. Um, and also we are looking to drive donations to help run um, mental health programs out of our Danny Frawley Centre in conjunction yeah. with Movember. Beautifully said, so your dad was one of the greats of the game and, and, uh, and I think he would be so proud of, uh, of what you and the family are doing with this game. Time to talk, it just it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. In the later years of his life, this was his one true passion. Um, he, yeah, I think he was a trailblazer in encouraging men to help uh, to have these conversations. Um, and I think he would just be incredibly proud that this is his lasting legacy. The uh, Danny Froy Centre for Health and Wellbeing is going to be back at Moorabbin, where your dad played so many uh, of his famous games for St Kilda. It's a great tribute to the family and tell us a bit about what we're going to see down there. Yeah, so the Danny Frawley Centre for Health and Wellbeing will have a big focus on mental health, but also physical health as well. Um, we're looking at, like, we're not the experts in this area, so we will be engaging with the experts. Um, currently, we'll be having uh, Movember's Ahead of the Game run out of the Danny Frawley Centre, which is a program that looks to upskill uh, young men at football clubs in having these tough conversations around your mental health and just educating them a bit more on... Yeah, having these conversations. I think there's some good signs, Joe, for me. I, I talked to the current players, uh, Chelsea's next generation. They, they seem much better at it than, than we were, more open and prepared to share. And you've seen lots of players come through in recent times, you know, young guns like Bailey Smith in recent times talking about his battles with mental health and anxiety. It just helps, doesn't it, when the wider public see some of their heroes be open about this? Yeah, I think it absolutely does. It also helps to reduce the stigma um, with the, this type of illness. Like, it shouldn't be shameful. You should be able to have these conversations with anyone, really. Um, and I think that, yeah, figures like Bailey Smith and Dad um, help to kind of break down those walls. So how important do you see the role of a football club, whether it's AFL or even grassroots level, has on its members and, and, and that general sense of community and mental wellbeing? Yeah, I think it's super important. I think football clubs and any sporting clubs in general are so unique that there's such deep social cohesion within these clubs. So I think that being able to educate um, teams on mental health resilience and having these tough conversations is super important because if you know that your mate at football training is going to be there for you, that's an easy conversation to have. Your dad achieved so much in his life and you know, on the field, off the field in the media, he was uh, like no one else I've ever met in my life. It's hard to describe uh, Joe to walk in a room with, uh, with Spud and, as I said, we miss him every day. I think the thing he's proudest of the most, though, was his only premiership was coaching you and your sister Danielle in a premiership for Halebury. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, Dad, Danielle and I went to our old school, Old Halebury, in 2016 and uh, asked if they were willing to house a women's football club out of there, um, which they were absolutely... They loved the idea. So we uh, galvanised a group of girls um, and trained for two years and then, yeah, in that last year, uh, the 2018 season, we um, managed to win a premiership, which was just amazing. Um, for him, he had never won a premiership himself, so... Um, yeah, I think that he was super proud to be able to share that moment with his daughters. And Is he more excited about it than you, potentially, Chelsea? He loved I was it. definitely very excited, <laughs> but I, having not played football before, didn't know the gravity of how important <laughs> it is to win a premiership and that has been his goal, so it was awesome. Chelsea, great to see you. We're so uh, glad to see you and your family you know, moving forward and continuing your, your, your dad's legacy in such a profound way, and thanks so much for joining us today on The House of Wellness. Thank you for having me. If you or anyone you know is struggling with depression, please start the conversation. As Spud said, manning up really is putting your hand up for help and we'll be back right after the break. Chest out, chin up, get on with it. That's fine on the footy field, but silence doesn't cut it anymore. To suck it up is to suffer. That's what he taught us. This is how we honour Spud and protect our mates. As a united football community, it's time to take a stand. It's time to rally around our mates. Help us fund vital mental health community programs. By donating at movember.com slash spud. Donate for the mate who's always been there. For the mate you haven't seen in months. And the mate who's no longer with us. 
conversation starts now. It's time to talk. It's time to talk. It's time to talk. It's time to talk. Welcome back. Before the break, we met Chelsea Frawley, the daughter of AFL legend Danny Spud Frawley. His legacy is helping other players speak up about mental health issues. Footy players like Danny and Neil Danaher, Joe, in his fight against motor neuron disease, have really inspired many people to look for the help that is out there. Yeah, one of those is former South Australian football star Mark Micken, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2016. At first, he wanted to keep his diagnosis a secret, but the example Neil Danaher has set in particular made him see the power of speaking out. Yeah, Mark is now a Parkinson's ambassador who's using his public profile to help others, and we caught up with Mark along with his surgeon, Dr Andrew Evans, to find out more about the disease that affects around 100,000 Australians. Healthy, would you say you were when you were diagnosed with Parkinson's? Yeah, yeah, I felt as though I was, I was fine, except I went to the doctor to be checked for a little tremor that I developed in my right hand and feeling a bit flat. But I just, I just put that down to feeling as though footy was be, become a bit of a chore, and uh, we weren't going as well as we would have liked at that stage. So I felt that that was probably to do with it. And then uh, I was advised to go and see a neurologist about my tremor. And uh, that's when uh, I found out that I, I had Parkinson's. Did it come as a shock to you? Uh, yeah, it did come out of the blue a bit because, as I said before, I was feeling OK, apart from you know, having that little tremor. And I didn't really worry about that too much. But uh, and it's interesting that the, the test they give you is so simple that I didn't really believe the, the doctor when he said that I had it because... I thought I did really well in the test. You know, like test, they, they do things like touch your nose and move your fingers and go for a little walk and they watch you walk. He, he, he diagnosed me with Parkinson's. Really? That, I find that very surprising too. Yeah, there's no, there's no you know, blood test or anything like that and they can only give you an up to 80% certainty that you have got it. And so, of course, I asked if I could get a second opinion. She was happy with it. Then I went to another guy and he did the same test and got, I got the same result. And I understand, to begin with, you didn't want to reveal your illness. Uh, that's very true. I, like a lot of people who get diagnosed with Parkinson's, I guess they'd like to, they'd like to sort of suffer in silence and, and push through it the best way they can. And we kept it as a secret for a while, but after a while we had to release it. And once I, once I came clean with it, I felt quite liberated in that I could do something for the cause. I was previously only thinking of myself, but once I got out there, I thought, well, I could do something here that might help everyone who's been afflicted by the condition. And also, you know, someone like Neil Danner, who's put himself out there in a very public way for MND, made my uh, situation seem insignificant almost compared to his. In 2019, you had surgery called deep brain stimulation. How would you describe that surgery? Uh, fairly brutal. <laughs> Um, it involves, well, for me, for that, I've had actually had two lots of dead brain stimulation. I've had two operations on my brain. But we had limited success. And as, as a result of having limited, limited success, we discussed me possibly having a second operation. And we decided to go that way. Since having the second operation, I've had, you know, mediocre success. Uh, Dr. Andrew Evans is my, uh, one of the world, world's leading neurologists, and he finds that my particular case is quite difficult in, to deal with in terms of um, adjusting the amount of stimulation that goes to the brain. So uh, it's been a real juggling act for me and for uh, Andrew Evans. Yeah, so Mark had a very bad tremor that really didn't respond to the medications at all and it was incredibly disabling. When we treat Parkinson's with deep brain stimulation, we have different uh, expectations on what sort of symptoms will and won't respond. What we do is we implant an electrode in an area of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus. This is the most typical form of surgery. Then we uh, connect those wires once we're happy up to 
some uh, connectors and a pacemaker that's implanted under the skin, under the collarbone uh, and connecting to the brain. And this allows us to communicate with those electrodes to make um, adjustments in the stimulation intensity uh, to get the best treatment effect on the symptoms of Parkinson's stiffness, slowness and tremor. We're able to determine not only could we achieve good stimulation effects, but also we could identify that the electrodes were perfectly placed in the regions that we were uh, targeting. I understand that Mark has had his surgery twice. Is that common? Yeah. The surgery is typically successful in the first go. But with Mark, what we found was that the tremor, particularly in the right hand, while it was improved, it wasn't improved enough to help his symptoms of tremor. So he got a, a really good response with the stiffness and the slowness uh, with the first surgery, but it was the tremor that we really wanted to get right with the second surgery. Are all patients suited to DBS? Not all patients are suited to DBS. About one in five people uh, have uh, a, a good benefit with this treatment. It sounds like truly amazing surgery, but does it always work? It doesn't always work, though. Uh, sometimes you do miss the targeting. Um, that happens uh, rarely. Or sometimes the individual just has a, a shake or a tremor that, that really won't respond to any sort of surgery, or occasionally you see a, a really good response early on, and then as the tremor continues to get worse underneath the stimulation, you can see that the tremor can come back to some extent. What's the main message you would like to get out there about Parkinson's? The main message is that people need to keep moving. Um, I think that I go to, there's a place in Adelaide that I attend called the Brain and Body Fitness Studio, which is run by Parkinson's SA. It's really helped my strength, flexibility, endurance, and balance. And doing nothing is the, is the worst thing you can do. There was a time when I did nothing and my, I went backwards at 100 mile an hour. Visit the Brain and Body Fitness Studio one day to know that there is a place they can go where they can control their symptoms a little bit better than they might already. Well, we all know what we should be eating, right? A balanced diet that's chock full of whole foods like fresh fruits, veggies and whole grains and making sure that nutrition and dietary needs are met becomes even more important for people like Mark. Yeah, there's no special recommended diet. The word is that high fibre is the go-to for people suffering Parkinson's to keep everything moving, Joe. But it can be confusing sometimes. Well, that's because one of the side effects of Parkinson's can be constipation due to a slowdown of the digestive system. So drink plenty of water and bump up your fibre intake and eat a banana. <laughs> when they're ripe, bananas help gut health and keep us regular. But don't take it from me. Here's Heinze and GQ to tell you why we should all be going bananas for healthy eating. We are back in the House of Wellness kitchen proving just how versatile healthy ingredients can be, GQ. You don't have to have a salad of every meal of every day. Olives are a great example. You've got the fruit itself, the oil, which I'm using in today's banana bread, and the olive leaf. I love it, Heinzie, that you're making healthy banana bread, and it shows that we don't have to move away from sweet treats to look after ourselves. And speaking of looking after ourselves, it's important to consider olive leaf because winter's coming. This is the time of the year when we look out for common colds and mild fevers. People don't often connect the olive leaf with immunity, but it comes down to the antioxidant properties, right? Spot on. The antioxidant is alluropine, which is antiviral, antibacterial and anti-inflammatory, all qualities that are going to support our body's immune defence. And the body needs all the help it can get to fend off infection. It works hard to keep us healthy and twice as hard when we're sick. And then there's the symptoms. I hate having a runny nose or a sore throat. And I also hate waiting for my banana bread. So I've got to get this in the oven. Wow, look at that. And another mineral to keep an eye out for for our immune system, Hansi, is zinc. Now, zinc is important. It actually helps us resist infection. And if you're sick, it improves our recovery rate. We get better faster. Zinc's a fantastic one that you can actually get from real food sources, eggs meat, shellfish, and then legumes, nuts and seeds for our vegan and vegetarian friends. And you can also get olive leaf and zinc in supplement form. Sounds as good as this banana bread looks. 
The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy. For superior supplement, for healthy energy and vitality, try New Zealand's number one premium supplement. Now available in Australia. Welcome back. Well, one of our hardest working, but perhaps least cared for body parts, Joe, is our ears. We really only ever pay attention to them if they don't work or something goes wrong. Well, you know, on that, Das, I've been thinking about the sounds that really irritate me. <laughs> Sorry. It's not I you. you. I was waiting it's for that. I knew where you were going with that. <laughs> I found a study in the US that shows how our brains react to unpleasant sounds. And do you want to know what the most annoying sounds are? Well, it would have to be the, the nails on the blackboard's got to be right up there. Yes, along with a knife scraping against a bottle, a baby crying, and an angle grinder or electric drill. I'd put my husband's chewing on that <laughs> list. <laughs> On the flip side, though, the sound of bubbling water, a baby's laugh, thunder and applause were rated as the most pleasant sounds. Our ears never switch off, so let's listen to the doctors past and present who are educating us all on ears. Hi and welcome to Medicine Past, Present and Future. My name's Dr Nick and I'm the past. And my name's Dr Isabel and I'm the future. And together, we're, we're the, the present. present. Now, Dr Isabel, I've got a question without notice for you. Ah. <laughs> Where do you find the smallest bones in the human body? Uh, Dr Nick, I did enough trivia in 2020 to know the answer to this one. It's in the ear. It's the malleus, the incus and the stapes and they form the ossicles. Yes, these three tiny bones that conduct the hearing from the tympanic panic membrane or the eardrum through to the hearing mechanism. And they're housed in the middle ear, which is kept nicely aerated and open by the eustachian tube. Unless... Oh, oh unless, uh, unless infection comes along, which causes swelling in the tube, blockage, and then fluid collects. And that fluid gets infected, giving you otitis media. And this is when your two-year-old wakes up at two in the morning with a high fever and screaming. That's often otitis media. And the best prevention for otitis media, funnily enough, is breastfeeding. It's pretty much good for everything. Now, the other really common ear infection is otitis externa, or swimmer's ear. Now, this is really common because when water gets in the ear, it can cause damage and irritation. But there's another reason that people get otitis externa, Dr Isabel, and what's that? It's fiddling with your ears, Dr Nick. So whether that's your fingertip or a pencil, anything that's putting a foreign body inside that ear can cause really small scratches, micro abrasions, which give bugs, bacteria and viruses a lot of port of entry, but also little areas to stick to. So while it's really important for swimmers to protect their ears from water with plugs or a well-fitting swimming cap, just remember your mum's advice, nothing smaller than your elbow goes in your ear. Now, no conversation about ears would be complete without my favourite topic, which is ear wax. <laughs> now, what's that all about? Well, ear wax is a natural substance produced by the body to protect our ears. Our ears are very delicate, and this substance helps to catch dust and particulate matter on the outside of our ears to stop it getting any further. So if you've got all that dust and particles and wax, <laughs> how do you clean it out? I love this question, Dr Nick, because our ears have this wonderful mechanism. Essentially, the skin in our ears grows from the inside outwards. Our ears are just tiny conveyor belts. And your cotton bud might come out with a little bit of wax on it, but actually what it's really done is shove most of the wax further in. So remember what we said earlier, your mum's advice? Nothing, Nothing smaller, smaller than, than your, your elbow goes, goes in, in your, your ear. ear. Joe, a big story we spoke about a few weeks ago was the Health Star rating for 100% fresh fruit juice has been dropped from five stars to as low as two stars. Yeah, it was a big surprise to hear that fruit juice is less healthy than diet cola. And now there's a debate about whether diet soft drinks are actually a better choice than your regular high sugar soft drinks. The thing is, when you have a soft drink, Joe, you're normally pairing that with a burger or something <laughs> yes. fried. You don't tend to think of a salad or something healthier to go with a soft drink. So it's that whole high fat, 
high sugar package. Yeah, nutritionists agree that soft drinks have no nutrients, fibre or protein, just the lure of something sweet. And we all know how alluring something sweet can be. At least 100% fruit juices that contain pulp are a good source of fibre and vitamin C. That makes more sense to me. Whatever side of the debate you're on, there's no doubt that eating whole, unprocessed fruit has to be the best way and also supporting our Aussie farmers at the same time. Here's Heinzy now with his own all-star rating of the many foods that are packed full of nutrients and that all-important vitamin C. Welcome back to the House of Wellness Kitchen where I am most at home creating delicious recipes that combine my two great loves, health and flavour, but don't be fooled that you have to pick just one. And I think my first exposure to the health space when I was younger is the importance of vitamin C, which most people associate with oranges. I know I look back to Saturday school sport and having sliced oranges or a big glass of fresh OJ with my brekkie in the morning. Well, today I'm going to take it to the next level and amp up the breakfast experience and make a delicious orange breakfast smoothie with an extra hit of vitamin C thanks to the Melrose Vitamin C Powder Range. Vitamin C is an essential vitamin that our bodies cannot store or make, which is a shame because it's so important for our overall health and well-being. Most notable is our immune health, which can be supported by vitamin C, which can help reduce the length and severity of colds, especially at this time of year as we lead into those colder months. But what you might not expect is that vitamin C plays a role in the beauty space. Now, our beauty expert, Jade, is always telling me how vitamin C helps promote the production of collagen, which results in healthy hair, skin and nails. Finally, being a powerful antioxidant, it helps our body protect against oxidative stress, which can cause ageing and illness. That's a big job for a water-soluble vitamin that needs to be added to our bodies every day which is why today I'm including a powdered vitamin C supplement. It is so quick and easy to whip up that I know you're sitting at home screaming through the TV saying, Luke, we don't all have time to whip up a delicious breakfast smoothie every day. I hear you, never fear, I've got a solution. Powdered vitamin C supplements are a quick and easy alternative for those with hectic schedules. With natural orange flavoured like the one that I used in today's recipe or a flavour free option that is undetectable in water, juices and smoothies. The sky's the limit with what beverages and breakfast bowls it can be added to. Powdered vitamin C is absorbed more efficiently and perfect for those who don't want to take tablets. What I love is that you can prepare it in a smaller dose for those that might be getting their vitamin C in other delicious food sources. Well, there you have it. You have no excuses for boosting those vitamin C levels, but uh, now I'm left with two drinks. Gerald? Joe? Darth? <laughs> I'm Jay Kisnorbo and I'm all about the latest beauty, hair and makeup trends. And I'm Polly Harding and working in radio, I've still got a lot to learn about the beauty boom. Together, we're going to bust those beauty myths, strip things back to basics and learn a few new tricks in the process. Jade, I think it's quite widely known that probiotics have a really positive impact on our gut health, but they also have a really strong link with our oral health as well. And that's because just like our gut health, there's good bacteria and bad bacteria. So it's really important to invest in a brand that really understands oral health, like Henry Bloom's. Keeping your teeth healthy for me is really important, um, especially in the field I work in. We are very close to people, so I think Brushing your teeth, using mouthwash and always carrying some mints on you is kind of just a day-to-day must-have. The whole range is amazing, keeping minty and fresh. However, the one that I'm going to focus on today, PJ, is the whitening probiotic toothpaste. It actually naturally removes stains and keeps your teeth nice and white. You've got me here because this is one thing I really struggle when I'm looking for toothpaste. I want to get that whitening toothpaste. That's not bad for me. And this has got baking soda, which is a natural way of actually removing those stains. And it's also got the dental lac, which just helps you have healthy teeth and gums. Dental lac is an exclusive probiotic strain that's formulated for dental hygiene. It balances the microflora in the mouth just like it does in the gut. 
When I came across the Henry Bloom's Oral Health range, what appealed to me the most is how natural it is and it doesn't have any nasties. I think with so many families, um, we are making small changes and this is the first step in just educating our children and us about oral health and really stripping it back and having natural ingredients. I see they've also got a probiotic toothpaste for kids, which will be amazing for your little girls. I'm telling you, PJ, when you have children, one of the biggest hurdles at night to overcome is brushing the teeth. Well, I remember, like, every time you'd have toothpaste or something else, you'd have a different flavour. It would just clash and taste disgusting. I think the biggest thing for children is the taste. It's so much stronger in their mouth than what it is in ours. So my daughter loves the organic watermelon the best. Who wouldn't? A toothpaste that tastes like watermelon. But there's also organic orange or flavourless. Jade, with all this talk around dental care and oral hygiene, I have one question. What is it? How's my breath? <laughs> Minty. Is it? Really? So, Joe, are you good at remembering people's names at work functions and parties, or do you forget the moments after you've been introduced? I can be really good if I concentrate and I re repeat the person's name when I hear it. That's your but trick, But I have to it? remember that, right, okay. to do that, or otherwise, no, no hope. I'm constantly scrambling, going, help me out here, I've got to find out that person. I know I know them, I yes. know I should know them, and I've occasionally had a stab and got it wrong, which is... Oh, no, that's terrible. Don't you just, it's better off just saying, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Can you remind me? That would make me? sense, but I haven't got to that <laughs> point yet. We will do Reintroduce ourselves to people we've already met or accidentally look straight through friends or a colleague on the street. That is an awful feeling. Yes. But there's an actual condition for this, Joe. Yes, it's called prosopagnosia or face blindness where you simply cannot recognise familiar faces. It can cause massive social anxiety and fears that you're coming across as cold or rude, which was the case for a UK artist now based in Melbourne, who knows firsthand that recognising the condition is the first step to finding positive solutions. For as long as she can recall, Melbourne's spoken word artist, Fleecy Malay, has had trouble recognising the faces of even her closest friends. I remember when I was in my late teenage years, I just kind of began to believe that I was either really stupid on some level, like some part of my brain didn't work and I was a bit stupid, or that, um, that I was really self-obsessed. And as someone who's very outgoing, I'm a performer, I'm out there, that's a story that I get told, that you get told a lot when you're a kid, like, oh, you always want to be the centre of attention. So it just kind of fed into this idea that I was so consumed with myself that I couldn't even remember other people's faces. And, um, and it, it really played, played into my self-worth. So I often just didn't let on that I didn't recognise who they were. And I would just kind of pretend that I knew who they were and I'd be having conversations. And while I was having the conversation, like 20% of my mind would be listening to what they were saying and engaging in the conversation. And the rest of my brain is scanning and trying to work out who they are. So I think I would really lose out on genuine connection in those moments and genuine feelings of closeness with people because I was basically pretending the whole time. Throughout her 20s, Fleecy did all that she could to avoid social embarrassment. But it took an awkward moment for her to finally discover the root of her problems. I was sat at a table in a restaurant with a group of friends and some people that I didn't know. And I turned to the person next to me and I said, hi, I'm Fleecy. And she went, Fleecy, you do realise that that's the 13th time this week that you have introduced yourself to me. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I just, I don't know why. I just really struggle to recognise people. I'm really sorry. And um, a few hours later, I was sitting next to her and she said, you know, I have this friend who has this condition called face blindness. Face blindness, or prosopagnosia, is a neurological disorder where the parts of the brain responsible for face perception are impaired. The word prosop means face in Greek and agnosia means ignorance, so it's face ignorance is the word itself. And um, it's related to facial recognition, which is a spectrum 
So you get, at one end, you get super recognizers, people that just remember every single face they've ever met in their entire life. And then at the other end, you get extreme prosopagnosia, which is people who can't recognize their own face in a mirror or their parents' faces and people like that. If that's the scale, I'm kind of 80% way along that scale is kind of how I put myself. I'm not an extreme prosopagnosia, but there are people who are very close to me whose faces I still don't recognize, especially out of context. When people hear the term face blind, I think people think that I literally can't see faces, uh, which kind of feels absurd to me because I can see faces. I can see your eyes, I can see your nose, I can see your mouth. But I might look at your face and I can't relate a memory of a person that goes with that face. It just feels like a face. It doesn't have any personality connected to it unless I get prompted. And then once I'm prompted about who that person is, it's like, it's like it comes into focus or like two pieces kind of joined together and I get to see the whole person. Since finding out about her face blindness, Fleecy has had a new lease on life. It took this, this sense that I'd had in myself that I was innately a bad person because I couldn't remember people or an innately stupid person because I couldn't remember people and suddenly just made me a person with something that I struggle with because of my brain. And it made, took away all the shame. And so I started to just tell people when I met them. I'd say, hey, just so you know, we're having this great conversation right now. I have this condition, which means if you see me in the future, I might not know who you are. It's pretty scary, it's pretty gross. It's given me a real gift. It's given me the gift of kind of forcing me into radical honesty. Like I can't, I've learned that not being honest to people doesn't create connection and it leaves you feeling lonely. And one of the things I think I admire about myself the most or the part of myself I love the most is how committed I am to honesty. And that goes hand in hand with what I've had to do with this condition, yeah. Welcome back. Well, Joe, we started today by looking at some life-changing inventions in the assistive technology field. Now, apart from your laptop or the obviously mobile phone, what's the one gadget that's changed your life for the better? Well, I mean, everybody loves their microwave and dishwasher, don't they? You wouldn't want to be without that, but I am obsessed with my electric toothbrush. Really? Oh, it gives you the best clean. <laughs> Squeaky clean. I love it. The other one that I use every day is the Spotify or the streaming. That, yes. to me, is a game changer. To Still don't know the name of any song, as but you know. I know that. That's not my strength. <laughs> the fact that you've got any song at the touch of a button, I reckon, it is just genius. Brilliant. Well, let's end it on a high-tech note for today. You can check out our website for more information on the show. And tune into the House of Wellness radio show every Sunday with Joe Stanley and GQ. And this week's Sunday Lift Out features fashion stylist Renee Enright on the cover. Renee's the number one supporter of her Geelong cat's husband, Corey, and a busy mum of three. So check it out to get her tips on looking and feeling great every day. She's great, Renee, and Corey was one of the all-time great players at Geelong. Thanks, as always, to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time. Yeah.